Many of you are registered for the entire series. Today we are pleased to sponsor session five um, in, this, in this series of eight LTE virtual learning sessions taught by our vendor, Award Solutions. And the LTE Bootcamp series will cover LTE technology and standards, not the Alcatel solution or product. There will be additional training presented to cover our solution. Oops, that's the wrong slide. If you look at the entire series. Today's topic session is LTE traffic operations, and it will be taught by Dr. Nisha Tripathi. Dr. Tripathi has received his PhD from Virginia Tech and has worked at Nortel and Huawei, Huawei in radio resource management, algorithm design, and system performance, and he has spent more than four years teaching for award solutions. Just a few logistical details before I turn it over to Nisha. And for help during this session, please email or IM me. I'm at bdeviller at alcatellucent.com, bdeviller. Your course materials can be found on the Alcatel Lucent University LMS. There were directions included in the confirmation letter as to how to access those materials. And during the session, the audio bridge will be muted, and but will be open periodically for Q&A. And of course, you can always um, send your questions via chat um, while the, the bridge is muted. And by the end of this week, you can expect to receive an email that contains the tablet PC file that Nisha uses for session drawing, so the markings that he makes um, will be saved and, and distributed. And at the conclusion of the session, we will allow the final 10 minutes as an opportunity for you to give your evaluation online, um, and that's very important for us. So I ask you to complete the evaluation when the course is over. And for those of you that have not attended one of these live meeting sessions before, a quick overview of the, the environment. The function 5 or F5 key on your keyboard will um, toggle you between the full screen of the slides and the entire live meeting window. So if you want to see the slides more closely, press F5 on your key, on your function keyboard. And you'll notice that the chat area, there's a Q&A area at the bottom of your screen. If you type in the, the lower portion of that screen, that open field is where you can put your questions in. And Nishit will see those, and he will respond to those during his presentation. And next to that area is the seating chart, and that lets you know where everybody is in, in the room um, in a digital way. And you'll notice that right now all the seats are green. We may ask from time to time that you change the seat color. There is a, a button at the drop-down menu for changing the seat color. That allows us, if we want to gather some feedback from you without ever having to open up the bridge, um, we could just ask you to change the color from green to some other color. And I believe that's the end of the, the logistics portion, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Nishit Tripathi. Nishit, sorry Nishit. Hello, welcome to session number five, Traffic Operations. So in the PDF file that you have, you have all the acronyms, and as I have mentioned in the past, we also have an integrated uh, list of acronyms. So feel free to have that handy. Before we get started, if you could please participate in a couple of polls. Uh, about 30 seconds for this one. The conference has been muted. And please uh, participate in the polls. And as Bruce mentioned, uh, maximize the use of questions box. And I will send you quick acknowledgement once I look at your question. 
and then I will respond at a suitable time. Okay, so, okay, about 50% customer support, about 40% system test integration. If some of you are still uh, filling out, okay, out. Okay. Please um, answer this question, this will help me figure out uh, the type of details that I should provide during the session. And no limit on the number of questions that you can ask, so uh, feel free to ask questions anytime. We'll um, unmute the bridge periodically when we take uh, some short breaks and at that time you can ask the questions using the audio bridge also. Okay. About 50% uh, uh, of 15, 20, oh, about 75% do not want too much. Uh, okay. Okay, I will try to keep it at the medium complexity uh, from the perspective of details. But if you do have detailed questions, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, we will try to make sure that uh, we meet your requirements. And for the folks who do not want too much, uh, please have some patience. Uh, sometimes we may need to go into the details in answer to some questions. Okay, but I will try to keep this at uh, a medium degree of uh, details level. Okay. okay. Uh, your answer to this question will give me some idea about your background. Uh, and we can correlate what you may already be familiar with with some LT concepts. So uh, about 30 seconds uh, for this one. Okay. Yeah, about 80% uh, would be dealing with LT and 1X, 1X video. Okay, and the rest would be... Okay, thank you. Okay, in terms of uh, what we plan to accomplish today, we look at um, the basic four-step process of downlink uh, data transmission, and we'll also take a look at the uplink data transmission. Along the way, we will discuss the concepts uh, such as CQI, PMI, RI, three ways of allocating resources, type 0, 1, and 2. We'll also discuss what is a virtual resource block. You will be able to differentiate between persistent and non-persistent scheduling. For the uplink, we have so-called buffer status reports. So we look at the types of those. And finally, toward the end of the session, we'll consider miscellaneous topics such as the timing alignment, power control, and discontinuous reception. So this is what we have in store for us for the next uh, couple of hours. Okay, so what has happened so far? We have carried out 
the head edge operation after power on. And as part of that, we have done synchronization. We have learned about the system by observing uh, physical broadcast channel and physical downlink section. They contain master information block and system information block. We have also established RRC connection. And during that process, we got our own dedicated identity, CRNTA. So think of that like Walsh code or MAC index. We have, as part of that, also taken care of uh, authentication. UE authenticates the network, network authenticates the UE. We have taken care of security. So we can do encryption if we wish. We can do integrity protection of signaling messages. We have also established so-called default bearer. Now this default bearer gives us always on connectivity. There is no real guarantees of data rates or anything like that, but at least whenever the station has resources, it will allocate those for the uplink and downlink to that user. But the main idea here is to provide always on connectivity. So if you do want to have strict control over quality of service, then you need to establish dedicated batch. So for voice or IP, your video streaming, uh, it would be uh, a good idea to have dedicated bearers because that's what will enable you to have tight control over quality of service. So let's say we established uh, even um, dedicated barracks. And next, we are just waiting for our resources. So perhaps every subframe, we will look for our allocation. That is the downlink control channel carrying my allocation or not? And the physical downlink control channel carries not only the downlink allocation, but also the uplink allocation. Okay. So both the downlink and uplink allocation would come in the form of some DCI, downlink control information. And that goes over the um, this uh, control channel, downlink control channel, the DCI. So some format is for uplink, let's say format zero is for uplink. The other formats are for the downlink allocation. Okay, so let's first focus on the downlink data transmission and then we will take care of uplink data transmission. Here are the main steps of the downlink traffic operations. The UEs in a cell would send out Information such as CQI, PMI, RA, channel quality indicator, rank indication, pre-coding matrix indicator, etc. And such reports can be sent over the uplink control channel or it can be sent over uplink shared channel. So one of the two channels will be used. Now our E node B has received the reports from the UE and it will execute a scheduling algorithm. Now, let's say we decide to send data to um, some users here. Then the downlink control channel will allocate the downlink resources. So perhaps we may say that, okay, user number one, we will allocate a resource block maybe 0, 1, and 2. Uh, UE number 2, perhaps we would give the UE resource block 3, 4, or all the way up to maybe 20, something like that. So we are able to allocate resources to the user. And resources are specified in the units of resource block. Now, who will tell me how many subcarriers we have in one resource block? Number of subcarriers in one resource block. 
and you can type in your answer in the questions box. Okay, let's say we have one answer. Okay, a dozen. Excellent. So we have 12 subcarriers in one resource block. And those are consecutive subcarriers, okay, neighbors of one another. Thanks for the answer. So as a UAV know which resource blocks and hangs which subcarriers are for us. And then we will look at the downing shared channel and get our data from those uh, resource blocks. Let's say we are able to successfully decode the packet, then we will send a hybrid ARQ positive acknowledgement. However, in case we could not decode the packet correctly, then we will send a negative acknowledgement over the one of the two channels. Either we can use uh, uplink uh, control channel or uplink share channel to carry such information. In case we have indicated negative acknowledgement, the base station says, okay, this terminal needs some help, so let me retransmit the packet on the downing shed. Okay. Those are the basic steps. And the critical piece of uh, software is the scheduling algorithm because that is making all kinds of decisions. Who should be uh, getting data at using which modulation scheme, uh, how much coding we should put, etc. So scheduling algorithm will be a proprietary algorithm. So every vendor will have its own version of that algorithm. Okay. So what we will do next is take a look at each step in more detail. Okay. That's the focus for the next few minutes. Okay, so the first step in the downlink transmission process is for the UE to provide feedback. Okay, one of the important pieces of feedback is CQI, Channel Quality Indicator, CQI. CQI goes from 0 to 15 because we have 4 bits, so we can have up to total 16 values, 0 through 15. Low value such as CQI1, that corresponds to poor general condition. On the other hand, the large value, let's say 15, that corresponds to the best possible channel condition. So here the UE is saying that, oh, I have excellent channel conditions in the downlink. And the reason behind the CQI is since it quantifies the channel conditions, we know what kind of modulation we can use, what, how much coding we should put uh, with that will enable our UE to retrieve the packet uh, reasonably reliably. So um, I will give you one example. Let's calculate uh, efficiency. Uh, and that would be defined as number of input bits per modulation symbol period. So you can calculate that by multiplying the coding rate with number of bits per modulation symbol. So for CQI value 1, we have the coding rate of 78 bits, whatever number you see in the table, divide that by 1024. Now that is fixed in the standard. So whatever uh, number you see here, 78, you just need to directly put it there. And that will give you 0 0.0762. Uh, since we are using QPSK, one QPSK symbol represents two bits. So efficiency can now be calculated by multiplying those numbers. So you will get 0.1523. So it means that during the modulation symbol period, on one subcarrier, we are effectively sending out 0.1523 bits. Okay. So very little information, right? So we have a lot of written And the reason that we are doing that 
if channel conditions are so poor, we are not able to send a lot of information. If you contrast that with Secure 15, we are sending out 5.5 bits during a given modulation symbol period. So very little redundancy. And the reason for that is we have super duper channel condition. So in summary, depending on the CQI value, we as a E node B would know how much coding, what kind of modulation scheme to use for that specific queue. Okay, so we let's say sent out some uh, secure value. Now, what exactly are we trying to meet? What is our target quality of service? So, okay, the target is 10 percent or lower block error rate. So, what we are telling the base station is the following: that let's say I send secure value first. If the base station sends us data on the downing shared channel using the modulation scheme and the amount of coding corresponding to that CQI with certain assumptions, then we are guaranteeing to the E node B that I will experience 10% or lower block error rate. And the 10% is fixed in this term. Okay. So that's the instantaneous error rate. And if you think that's too high, don't worry because we have retransmission, right? So we have initial transmission, 90% chance that it will be decoded correctly. But uh, in case there is a problem, then we can always retransmit within few milliseconds and then it will drop to 1% error rate very, very quickly. So in summary, the CQA value is aiming to get 10% or lower block error rate. So 10% block error rate or frame error rate is what we are after. And uh, what are these assumptions? We are saying that, okay, uh, we will get our packet in one subframe, uh, coding and modulation associated with the secure value, and the power on the data resource element. And resource element is nothing but uh, one subcarrier and one symbol type. We will have an overhead of three of them symbols in one subframe. When all those conditions are met, then the instantaneous error rate would be 10%. Okay, the block error rate um, is defined by the standard. Yes, exact. Actually, this table is from the standard, and we are trying to meet 10% error rate for all the secure values. Okay, so we will get 10% error rate. So for example, uh, if the base station, let's say, sends us uh, QPSK modulation symbol and uh, the amount of redundancy corresponds to this, uh, and we have the power that follows this formula, then for that CQA value 5, we will get 10% error rate. So that block error rate is only one value. There is only one value, and that is for all the CQA values. So whichever CQA a user equipment picks, that CQA is associated with 10% error rate under current channel condition. Okay. So, but yeah, so that is different in the standard, and this table is also in the standard. Uh, anytime you want uh, additional details or some more explanation, just uh, uh, send another question. If I do not hear any follow-up question, then I will assume that you got your answer without any problem. Okay. So there is one feedback that we have. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, let's take care of that. 1024 is just a um, reference number that we are using fixed in the standard, because we want to just convey uh, how much uh, coding we have, right? So 
we need some baseline number. So that's why we have picked 1024. But there is no uh, magic behind that. We could have picked any number, any suitable number that will give us a reasonably good resolution in CQI. Okay. So this could have been any number. We just want to make sure that uh, uh, we can have this range uh, 1 through 15. And uh, any baseline number would have worked well. Any suitable baseline number. It could have been, let's say, 1,000 or 800 or 1,200. Or, or those numbers would also be quite valid. But we had to pick some number so that we can calculate the uh, efficiency associated with that secure value. So just the standard uh, reference number. OK, keep your questions coming. So one feedback that UE send is CQI. Then you have two other types of feedback, and they are for advanced antenna techniques. So one feedback is PMI. We'll discuss more um, when we have um, a, a whole new session for antenna techniques. Uh, we have, I think, that scheduled for tomorrow. So if you want, you can attend that for advanced antenna techniques. But I will at least summarize the basic idea behind this. PMI is pre-coding matrix indicator. And the main reason behind that feedback is to support spatial multiplex. So we have an example here. Let's say um, the PMI value is 1. So that value 1 corresponds to some sort of code book index for, let's say, two antenna transmission. So what is the meaning of that? It means that if I am sending out, let's say, oh, I'm sending out information from two different antennas. The R is rank indication. That will essentially tell you how many modulation symbols we can send on the same subcarrier, the number of modulation symbols on the same subcarrier from different antenna. So if the number is 2, then we can send one modulation symbol, S1, from one antenna, another symbol from another antenna. Both of them will use the same subcarrier, Fx. So in this example, I will use uh, from one antenna, I will send out, let's do simple calculation. OK, we have, let's say, S1 symbol. So maybe I will send out, let's say, Oh, actually, 2 by 1. So I let me give some of the, let's say A and B. Let me pick that. So I will, if I multiply, I will get A plus B. OK. And then I will get A minus B. OK. OK, so I've got two numbers. So this will go from antenna 0. This will be sent from antenna 1. I see. So what I could do, I could have this one going or F1, this also goes over F1. So I am sending out some complex numbers okay, uh, from two different antennas. Okay, but I am reusing the same subcarrier F1. So pre-coding matrix is telling us how we are changing the structure of the symbol. So in this case, if it is just A plus B, OK, let's try to make it even better. Let's say A plus JB, A minus JB. Here it is J. Yeah, let me write separately, A and J times. So in this case, 
I am sending out the modulation symbol with different phase. Because I made it negative. Right? So if this is my regular symbol, I am modifying the phase by um, if this is my a plus j b, then this would be a minus j b. Right? So I'm changing the phase of my modulation symbol. Okay. So we can do that by using the pre-coding matrix. Pre-coding is nothing but adjusting the phase of the modulation symbol. So in this fashion, we are able to modify the phase. And why we do that? Essentially, to help the receiver decode our modulation symbols properly. So we are essentially doing some kind of beamforming, some kind of spatial signature is imposed upon the modulation symbol. So the main idea behind pre-coding is we want to know what kind of phase adjustments we should make on modulation symbols when we send out signals from different antennas. But uh, we'll consider this in more details um, in the session that talks about antenna technique. But in summary, a pre-coding matrix is helping us implement advanced antenna techniques, and specifically, we are making some phase adjustments. Now, what is this rank indication? Formally, it is the number of useful transmission layers, and effectively, it means that this is the number of distinct modulation symbols we are able to send out on the same subcarrier. Same subcarrier. So if I have one antenna here, another antenna here, if I send uh, symbol one and another symbol, but I am reusing the same resource, same subcarrier then my rank indication is 2. If I have four antennas, and if I am able to send out a total of four modulation symbols, then I am using rank of 4, because all those four modulation symbols are sharing the same data subcarry. That is right. Okay. So in summary, this rank indication is basically also to help uh, advanced central techniques such as spatial multiplex. If rank indication is one, then essentially we are doing uh, something like transmit times because we are not sending different information. So for example, in that case, we will send the same modulation symbol from different antennas. Okay, so in summary, we talked about three types of reports, uh, CQI, uh, pre-coding matrix indicator, rank indication. CQI tells us that we are able to get 10% block error rate for a given combination of modulation scheme and amount of redundancy. PMI and RI, pre-coding matrix indicator, rank indication. That is to support advanced antenna techniques such as MIMO, uh, special multiplexing MIMO, and so on. Now, how frequently should we send the feedback report? Well, that is um, up to the E node B, and E node B can tell the UE that send me periodic report. So maybe every uh, five subframes we can tell the UE that send me the report. So every five milliseconds, the UE will send a periodic feedback report. So the periodic feedback report goes over the uplink control channel. However, wherever we send uh, our data channel in the uplink, uplink shared channel, we can just include our 
CQI, PMI, RI type feedback along with our data traffic. So whenever we send uplink share channel, no need to send a separate uplink control channel because uh, we will be able to send the feedback along with our data. We got two questions. Can rank indication be adjusted dynamically depending on channel condition? Yes. Very good question. So yes, we can adjust that. So whenever base station sends um, a packet on the downlink shared channel, the control channel will indicate whether we are using uh, one or two or how many antennas for transmission to reflect the rank indication. So yes, yeah, so it can change as fast as every subframe because the control channel is present in every subframe and that control channel will indicate uh, what uh, the terminal is supposed to look at, one antenna, two or four, etc. Uh, will PMI and RI reduce the data rate? PMI Oh, okay, okay. So this is going in the uplink. Uplink. So the idea is that when you send these kind of reports in the uplink, the e node scheduler will make the decision about the downlink transmission. And uh, if we indicate rank indication four, then e node we can send data from all the four antennas. So that will increase the downlink data rate. However, you can think of PMI and RI as overhead for the uplink. So from the uplink perspective, throughput will be slightly lower. That is correct. That is because we need some resources to send this kind of feedback, but not a whole lot. It's not a whole lot, just a few bits. So no significant impact um, of sending the PMI RI because they do not occupy too, too many bits, a few bits are consumed by them. And there are different kinds of uh, reports, different kinds of modes, uh, and depending on that, we will have maybe three bits for PMI or two bits for PMI and so on. Oh, we have some uh, clarification of the question. When we send the same uh, symbol from two antennas, we will lose the uh, gain by minus. That is correct. That is correct. So if you go this way, here, okay, when you do the transmit diversity, the goal of transmit diversity is to improve reliability. So that is correct. That will improve reliability, but because you are sending the same information twice, however, uh, no. significant throughput gain because you are reusing the same resource. So if you are really after throughput, then you should use special multiplexing type technique if the radio environment allows you to do that. Okay. Yeah, so compared to MIMO, that is correct. Our uh, transmit diversity will have lower throughput, of course. That is correct. Uh, Okay, so we answered all the questions so far. CQI, different types of reports. We can send only CQI, CQI with PMI and so on. Very, very flexible. The fastest feedback is every subframe. And we can configure the feedback report by exchanging RRC signaling messages. The scheduler will use the reports to determine should I use um, single antenna transmission, should I do transmit diversity, should I do uh, spatial multiplexing and so on. So e node based scheduler is in full control. So the scheduler is uh, quite uh, complex and that's what will differentiate architectural lucent product from the competitor's product because you can have very sophisticated algorithms there that will make your product better. Okay, time for me to ask you a question. Uh, please uh, participate in the polls.
And while we do hope that uh, you are not guessing, if you do need to guess, uh, feel free. And you have the PDF file. So again, hopefully you do not need to look at the PDF file, but go ahead. Uh, it is open book exam. If you do need to look at the material, go ahead. Let me give you about a minute to finish up this one. What kind of error rate are we aiming for? That is the basic question. What error rate did we mention? We mentioned a specific number for the error rate. Which was that number? In the meantime, we probably we should uh, take care of okay um let's see okay so by the time you guys are working on the survey I mean the poll let's uh, address this question uh, how we adjust the RI Yeah, I, this will require some um, yeah, some more time. So, yeah, let's discuss that after the poll is over. Okay, please, please uh, participate in the polls. We'll give you 30 more seconds. No penalty for a wrong answer. I do hope that we get close to 100% accuracy, but let's see what kind of performance we are able to get. 20 seconds. Okay. So let's share the results. Okay, 94% uh, correct answer. Very good. So 10% is the error rate. Okay, so whenever UE sends a QI, UE is promising to the network that uh, when those conditions are satisfied, the base station uses those parameters, then the UE will experience 10% or better block error rate. One more question, and then we'll answer the question on rank uh, indication. So let's aim for two minutes for this question. And please uh, participate in the polls. Okay. If you need more time, we will give you more time. Why do we have this uh, pre-coding and rank feedback? Thirty seconds. And uh, please uh, continue asking your question. That is the best way to get maximum benefits out of this session. And we want to make sure that all of your questions are answered. And uh, by the way, uh, in one of the previous sessions, uh, we had some uh, questions I was supposed to get back. One was uh, mapping between DSCP 
and uh, QCI. Yes, so I'll, I will work on that. Okay. Okay, let's share the results. Okay, so this time um, we have 100% uh, correct answer. So very good. So let's keep that as our target for next time. So you are right, uh, the main reason that we have this PMIRI to support advanced internet tech. Okay, now let's take care of this um, question that we have got here. Okay, that's about the rank uh, indication. So basically what is happening is our E node B has four antennas. Okay. And we are sending out a reference signal, so-called pilot, from all these antennas. Okay. And of course the reference signals, they are orthogonal, so they are using a different subcarrier. Okay. So let's say F1, F2, F3, F4, something like that. We are using different subcarriers. We need to have orthogonality. And now our UE is observing those pilots, so we have four receive antennas. And then it will take a look at the pilots and decide that, okay, how many signals, reference signals, it can separate. So maybe the answer is uh, out of four, we can separate out two signals. So in that case, the rank indication will be two. If on the other hand, we are able to separate all the four signals, so they are sufficiently different from one another, so then we will send rank indication value and that just depends on the channel conditions at that time and once the E node B receives this kind of feedback it will make a decision how many antennas it should use to send the modulation symbol so if the rank indication is two we will send two distinct modulation symbols using the same subcarry but of course we will use different antennas However, if the rank indication is just one, rank indication just one, then it means that, oh, we really cannot differentiate among those uh, signals. They are not sufficiently apart. So in that case, it is good idea just to use a uh, transmit diversity. So rank indication one, so it means that uh, no need, we should not be using any MIMO type technique, and then we will use transmit diversity. Okay, that is the best way to uh, operate in those uh, channel conditions. And normally, um, the graph would be something like that. This is signal to interference ratio. Okay. So, um, if we have low values, then uh, Okay, let's see here throughput. So at high, let's say uh, this would be MIMO type technique, and this would be let's say transmit diversity. So if we have low values of uh, signal to interference ratio. Then uh, at that time, it is a good idea to use um, transmit diversity okay. because channel conditions are so poor that we cannot uh, use uh, memo that will not give you good performance. Okay. And when the channel conditions are super duper high signal to interference ratio then we can use um, MIMO, 
that will increase the throughput significantly. Okay. Oh, he has done. Uh, so we have this question. Um, how? Oh, let's. Okay. Can you describe the PMI the same way? Actually, PMI is a little bit. Uh, tricky because here we are making some uh, phase adjustments. And if I really want to show you the uh, impact of PMI, we need to consider uh, two things. We need to consider pre coding and so called layer mapping. And that gives us the overall idea. If I just look at pre-coding matrix, it does not give you the whole story. So let me try to do this. Uh, let's see how much progress we make. Okay. And if we have some time left, then toward the end of the session, I will give you um, a concrete example of this. Otherwise, you can always come to the session tomorrow, and we'll give, we, we are discussing that anyway. Okay, so let's do this. Uh, depending on how much time we have, we'll take, take care of this. Okay. Uh, and if you do not plan on attending tomorrow's session, and if you want to get answer to this question, then either um, just before we end the session or after we end the session, we'll answer your question. Okay. okay. Uh, because the, it will take some time, and we are we have whole session for that, so we cannot fully justify that here, but. But we will answer your question. Okay. okay. Uh, then why would transmit diversity throughput be lower uh, with higher SIS? Oh. oh, okay. May, yeah, let me adjust my. Maybe I should. Uh, good, good point. Let me draw it a little different. With the real estate that we have here, okay, so it will improve, but we should use a okay. So we will have a throughput um, that is um, sort of um, you could say. Transmit uh, diversity. That would be something like monotonically increasing. So there should not be any penalty, but what I was trying to convey was there is some switch over point that up to this point it is a good idea to use transmit diversity. But after that we should switch to the MIMO tech. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your question. We can that help me correct the figure. Okay. How is CQI mapped to SINR? Very good question. Very good question. And that would be the short answer is it would be UE implementation dependent. So we need to uh, have some sort of table. So every UE vendor may have slightly different table, but effectively you have to measure signal to interface ratio for the downlink and then come up with the associated CQA. Okay. So maybe CQ value uh, X dB, X plus 2 dB. X plus 30 dB or whatever. So this will correspond to let's say CQ value 1, 1, 2, all the way up to 50. Okay. And that will be determined by every UE vendor independently. But at least all UE vendors need to guarantee 10% error rate. 
to whatever table they have, different vendors will have slightly different tables, but at least they need to be able to guarantee 10% error. So you can uh, start with the simulation and you can confirm through lab testing and then field trial. If you want uh, still additional information, just let me know. But that would be uh, in those uh, simulations, uh, then lab test, and finally field trial. So you start with simulation, that will give you some numbers. You can run simulations with different channel conditions and so on, and come up with that. You can do simple lab test, and finally, field trial will give you the most reliable table. But it, it will require some uh, extensive efforts. OK, uh, any other question, just uh, type it away. So, so far, we have one outstanding question. And about pre-coding, but since it will consume a lot of time, uh, let's wait. Okay. okay. Uh, keep your questions coming. Okay. Okay. Step number two. So basically what has happened is in step number one, the UE has sent out reports, CQI, PMI, RI, to the E node B. And now E node B has this proprietary scheduling algorithm that will determine which user it should support within a subframe, data rate, etc. So let's take a look at the scheduler. Now, scheduler will be a proprietary algorithm, as I mentioned, and it will consider many, many parameters. And we are just giving here some examples. So if you have your own algorithm, maybe you will have some additional parameters also. But these are some of the important parameters. Of course, the most important would be the feedback itself, the QI value, PMI, RI. That is coming over the uplink control channel or uplink shared channel. Also, we can take a look at the history. But in the past, whenever we sent packets to the user, was the user responding with uh, typically X or a lot of negative acknowledgement? So that's also another factor. What is the quality of service that we need to meet? So there may be several barriers with uh, different QS requirements, different UEs would have different requirements, so we will consider quality of service. Um, what are the capabilities of the UE? There are five categories uh, defined in UMTS, LTE. And even though we may have only one user in the system, I mean in our sector or cell, and even though there will be lots and lots of uh, data for the user, but if the user is only category one, then we cannot give 300 megabits per second because category one cannot support that. Only category five can support that. So the capabilities of the UE is also important when making the scheduling decision. Let's say we have category five UE, the best category from the performance perspective but maybe there is very little data for the user. So then it doesn't make sense to send lots of zeros. We have spent billions of dollars in getting the spectrum. No point in sending out zeros on that spectrum, right? So we need to consider how much data we have in the buffer for the user. Uh, how long the user has been waiting for data. And the reason for that is we want to provide fairness. If some user has been waiting for a long time, then we should give privacy to such users. And uh, in you know, one XC video at HRPD, we normally have some kind of proportional fairness algorithm and that ensures uh, fairness to a certain level. So you can implement some variation of that uh, for LT as well. 
what kind of resources are available? Okay. So depending on how much spectrum we have, we will have certain number of resource drops. So if I have uh, 10 megahertz uh, system, I would have 50 resource blocks total. Okay. So we need to consider availability also. So basically we consider all these various parameters and we have to decide which users we want to send data to. How we allocate the resources? Should I use type 0 or 1 or 2? What kind of allocation? Should I do persistent schedule, semi-persistent scheduling or non-persistent schedule? And for a given user, how should I create a packet? So those are the decisions that need to be made by an intelligent scheduling algorithm. Now so far we have not uh, mentioned in detail what these techniques are. We have not yet discussed the uh, type of allocation, persistent, uh, non-persistent. So we will consider that uh, next. Now three types of resource allocation. Now this is for the downlink. So right now we are focusing on the downlink. Then we will turn our attention to the uplink. But right now downlink is our focus. Okay, so type 0, 1, and 2, three types of resource allocation. What is type 0? So let's say I have uh, 50 megahertz spectrum, sorry, 10 megahertz spectrum, 50 physical resource blocks. Uh, physical resource blocks, basically, if I have this spectrum here, This is resource block 0, physical resource block 1, physical resource block 2, and so on. Total of 50 in my spectrum bandwidth. Physical means it corresponds to specific location of the subcarrier within the spectrum. And within a block, you will always find a dozen consecutive subcarriers neighbors of one another. Now what do I do with the physical blocks? I create so-called resource block group. So one group in this example consists of three physical resource blocks. Now how many resource blocks should I have within one group? Actually that depends on the bandwidth. Okay, so if I have 10 megahertz, I have 3 resource blocks within a group. On the other hand, if I have 20 megahertz spectrum, in every group, I would have 4 resource blocks. So it just depends. Okay. And that is defined in the standard, fixed in the standard. So let's talk about 10 megahertz. So I have created these kind of groups, a total of 17 groups. And uh, a group in this case has three blocks. So final, you can have a 51, but we have actually only 50, so the last one would have only two resource blocks. Then you will reach the last block number 49. In any case, we have created the groups. Now, what do we allocate to the user? We allocate groups. So the E node B provides to the user one or more groups. That is type 0. So the minimum allocation in this case would be one resource block group. And when you give one resource block group, the UE is getting three resource blocks. So this kind of resource allocation is suitable when you want to allocate large chunks of bandwidth. So if I say 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 all the way here, 0. That is the bit map that we are providing for research allocation. 
So whenever you see one, that's the resource block we have allocated to the user. Another one. So other resource blocks, not for that user. Maybe some um, other user. Okay. So in this case, we gave two resource blocks. This number zero and number two. So three times three blocks and two such groups. We are essentially giving six resource blocks. So one resource block has 12 subcarriers. So in this case, we are giving 72 total subcarriers to the user. So in summary, in type 0, we are specifying the bitmap for resource block groups. So even the minimum allocation would be one group, and one group already has three blocks. So the advantage of this kind of approach is that you can give large bandwidth, right? In fact, you can give the entire bandwidth to just one user. So you can have all one, 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 one. That is your bitmap. It means we gave all the resource block groups to a single user. So the benefit is that you can give a lot of bandwidth right, by using the bitmap. The disadvantage is that just one resource block, right, that is not possible. Because at the minimum, Right. In case of 10 megahertz spectrum, we have to give the whole group, and the group already has three resource blocks. So using type 0, you cannot give just one resource block to some user. Okay. You are allocating the bandwidth in terms of resource block groups. So minimum, it would be three blocks. So three blocks, six resource blocks, and so on. How about type 1? So in type 1, we go one step further. We create the groups just like what we did earlier, but then we create subset, subset 0. So in subset 0, what we need to do? I will pick one group from here, then another research block group. So I keep doing that, and I got, let's say, another research block group here. Then I go to the next one. This research block group one, I'll put in sub subset one. Then I skip, I go to the another and sub. So I have created now three subsets. This is for 10 metals. So different bandwidth would have different subsets. But in this case, I have three subsets. Now, let's pick subset number 0. Now, within subset 0, now I have some resource block groups. So I have block number 0, block number 1, block number 2, physical resource block 3, 4, 5, etc. Now the allocation would have a bitmap corresponding to the physical resource block. So if I put let's say one zero 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 one and let's say all other zeros, then I am allocating to the user block number zero, block number five. So I am giving two specific blocks because I put bitmap value one here and bit number one here in the bit. So I am able to address individual physical resource block. However, the problem is when you allocate the resources, you are allocating two things, the subset number and then bitmap for that subset. So you have to pick the subset number first. So let's say I pick subset number 0. Okay. So as soon as I pick subset 0, the maximum bandwidth that I can allocate is just one third of the overall bandwidth, right? Because in general, right, we have almost equal distribution of resources among the three blocks. 
since we have to pick the subset number first, we are already at one third the bandwidth. Right? So the problem with this kind of allocation is we cannot allocate the entire bandwidth. Right? You cannot give large bandwidth. The maximum bandwidth that you can give would be one third of the system bandwidth. However, the advantage is that even one PRB can be allocated. So minimum allocation can be just one PRB. Okay. So that is the basic idea behind type one, that we are able to give the minimum allocation, just one resource block. So we have much finer resolution okay, compared to type zero. However, the drawback is we cannot give the entire bandwidth. Oh, okay. Then type two. What do we do in type two? Type two, we have so-called virtual resource block. So if I have 10 mega spectrum, I have 50 virtual resource block, 0 through 49. And what we allocate to the UE is the starting block number and the number of consecutive VRB. So we can say that, okay, the starting number is, let's say, zero, and the number of consecutive blocks, let's say, three. So I start with this, and total of, total three blocks, so zero, one, two, and three. So I will allocate these three virtual resource box. So we have given three VRBs in this example to the user. But where is our actual data? The actual data would be on physical resource block. And that's where the localized and distributed blocks come into the picture. In case of localized block, physical block number and the virtual block number same. On the other hand, if I have distributed VRBs, then the mapping between the virtual and physical block depends on the frequency hopping formula, and that is defined in the standard. Okay. So that's the basic idea. Okay. So in summary, three types of resource allocation, 0, 1, and 2. Uh, type 0, the advantage is that we can give even the entire bandwidth because we can give all the groups to a single user. However, the drawback is that uh, uh, we cannot just give one resource block. The minimum would be three resource blocks. We do not have good resolution. Type one, the beauty here is that we can individually pick which physical blocks we want to allocate to the user. However, the problem here is that uh, we cannot give the entire band okay, because we need to pick the subset number first. Finally, type two is allowing us to give as little bandwidth as one block and as large as all the blocks. The minimum maximum, you can span the whole spectrum and you can do frequency hopping also if you wish. So in summary, those are the three types of uh, resource uh, allocation that are supported in the standard. Okay. And um, all those are for the downlink. For the uplink, we have this type of resource allocation. Even though standard doesn't explicitly call it type two or anything like that, but in the uplink, uh, we just give the starting block number and the number of consecutive blocks. Okay, let's take uh, a short break. And uh, once we come back from the break, we will give you an uh, opportunity to ask a question using the audio bridge. So let's have a 10-minute break now. 